go. Cool. Well, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming to my TED talk. Um, we'll be talking <laughs> a little bit about uh, OLAP cubes. Um, and my tagline here is standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, these are a concept that a lot of people have spent a lot of time thinking about in the past that really influences sort of the way data engineering has developed, um, but have sort of fallen out of favor, right, for, for various reasons, which we'll get into. Um, so getting started, this is me. Um, I am a data scientist engineer at Vareto. Um, started as a data scientist and really dove into the data engineering world um, and had to really get up to speed on these sort of things, which is where my, my interest in all this comes from. Um, so let's just dive right in. Um, what is an OLAP cube, right? And, and I think I alluded to this a little bit, um, a lot of the folks who are newer to the data engineering field have heard of this term, right? It's thrown around quite a bit, but it's really fallen out of favor. Um, and so there's sort of a lack of understanding in, in terms of what it actually is, how it was used and, and why it was developed um, to, to be a thing that was um, very useful. Um, so what does it actually stand for, right? OLAP is online analytical processing. It's a pretty outdated term, right? Now everything is done online. Um, and the, the key thing here is that it is in contrast to OLTP, online transactional processing, um, which now we know more of as CRUD, right? You are sort of insert a record, read a record, um, single small um, transactional operations versus the analytical side of things where you want to do these aggregations, a sum, a group by, those sort of things, um, a little more computationally heavy. The other piece of the term OLAP cube um, is really referring to the fact that these are tables um, that exist across multiple dimensions, right? They, they capture sort of multi-dimensional views of things, and then we'll get into a little bit about what that means. Um, the one thing I want to touch on here is that an OLAP cube, um, it, there is never an OLAP not cube, <laughs> right? These are uh, very tied together terms. So. Um, it's really just a structure for your data, which allows you to make quick queries, um, especially when you're, you're computationally strained. Um, and it's a framework that you can then build your analytic system on top of. So what, well, how did we get here, right? Why, what was the motivation for creating these cubes? Because really an OLAP cube is just a table. It's, it's a form of um, storing your data in a way that makes it accessible for querying. This was first sort of conceived in the 90s, right, where we were in a very different paradigm in terms of data engineering, right? Um, computation was, was slow. Um, everything was much more re resource constrained. Um, the size of your data, right, was really limiting. Um, so you didn't have these big clusters that you have now where you can query millions of records in, in no time at all. Um, so we're no longer resource constrained like that. Um, but back in the 90s, you very much were. Um, there was also this sense of no source of truth, right? So you could define um, revenue if you're trying to pull the revenue metric for a particular month, say. You could define it in one way, and, and another user could define it in another way, and frequently you know, we've got different values, what happened, and, and then you'd have to trace these things back. So there was no sort of single source of truth for what a metric should be. And this provides a framework where we're going to calculate it in one way, and then everyone can use that, that consolidated definition. So let's talk a little bit about the history before we get into the sort of technical um, description of the OLAP cube. Um, so before 1990, right, we had a lot of uh, database advances, right, starting with the inception of compu computing. Um, and then, you know, in the 70s, there were some major database advances. Um, and by the time you get to sort of the early 90s, we have these sophisticated databases, lots of transactions, which are sort of stored. Um, but using them could be painfully slow, right? They, they were, if your um, query, a particular user's query could take you know, hours to run, um, right? Especially if you're going back to that raw data, those large transaction sets. Um, 
So in 1993, uh, Edgar F. Codd, who is a database legend who also sort of did the major work in, in the relational database um, development. So he first used this term OLAP to describe these applications where you are essentially pre-aggregating. You're saying that I know what the aggregations my users expect to see are going to be. So I'm gonna do a lot of that computation beforehand and then give that flexibility to the user to just build queries on top of these pre-aggregated values. Um, he, in that uh, initial paper providing OLAP to user analysts, um, also referred to them as MOLAP. So you'll hear that term thrown around. Um, that just means multi-dimensional online analytical processing. There really is no single dimensional um, online analytical processing. So MOLAP is OLAP uh, that they really refer to this, the same thing. Um, this was a little bit of a scandal because he released this paper in computer world. Um, at the time he was consulting for Arbor Software. Um, that's, that's currently Hyperion. So they've, they've changed their name, but same company. Um, and he mentioned one of their products that was called S space. Um, the big scandal here was that he, he, um, was putting forward this new methodology without really mentioning, um, <laughs> that he may have some ulterior motives in terms of where his funding was coming from. Um, so computer world actually retracted the paper. They, um, sort of shut that down. You can still find it online though. Um, and it's, it's an interesting read. Um, the product, S-Base, right, was acquired by Oracle uh, in 99, I believe, and then it is developed into what's now called Oracle OLAP, um, and OLAP stuck around, right? The term didn't go away just because they retracted the paper. Um, so it, it had a lot of influence on other folks at the time, um, other structures sort of popped up that, that utilized this same OLAP uh, methodology. Um, cool. So after that came about, right, there was this big interest in, in using this new paradigm. Um, Microsoft and Oracle especially sort of took that on and built big products that continue even to this day. I mean, uh, Microsoft SSAS, um, you'll hear as the sort of current offering that they have. Um, so it's around, it's still, it's still here and very much live. So that is that. Um, Gosh, I got ahead of myself here. So OLAP did take over the world, right? Um, and, and the reason for this was, again, due to the constraints of the time, right? A lot of these queries would take forever. It would take you hours as a business user to, to get to the data you wanted. Um, so now you could make these queries hundreds of times faster because the data was pre-aggregated. That work was done overnight. So, you know, these pipelines would run and compute your uh, underlying values for you. And then you, your analyst would come in in the morning with everything ready to go. And they could just do these quick op, uh, group by operations and, and get the business uh, values they wanna see. What's interesting is a lot of the paradigms that we've introduced because of OLAP have still stuck around beyond, beyond OLAP. So especially this sort of slice and dice, I wanna do a group by, I wanna do a sort of filtering on this pre-aggregated concept, right? And, and even though it's no longer pre-aggregated, you want to apply these same sort of operations. Um, so it, it took over, right? And now we have sort of proceeded beyond it. We have better technologies, but fundamentally those operations, those frameworks that it set up are still around. Um, but like I was saying, so the SSAS is still around, Oracle, SAP, SAS, they all have versions of this. Um, and then there was, there's all sorts of languages associated with it as well to sort of geared toward these specific types of operations, MDX being sort of the, the main one that Microsoft came out with. So given all of that historical context, right, let's, let's talk a little bit about what is an OLAP cube really, right? It, it's just a table. At the end of the day, it's just a table. Um, and there's a lot of confusion that folks will have. What is it? What does this multi-dimensionality sort of mean? It's really just an aggregated table. So we'll, we'll go through a very simple example here um, just to sort of hit the point home. Um, 
So let's say you've got these transactions. These are your entire set of transactions where you've got a couple dimensions, right? You've got location, product category, you've got some time dimensionality here, and then you've got an amount which will end up sort of being what your users want to report on. What you can do um, is essentially pivot that, right? You're taking this raw data and you're creating an aggregate view. Um, that's all the OLAP cube does. So if you think of, oh shoot, I wanted to go back to the old. I guess going back does not take me out of my slide. Okay, so if I can flip back between these. If these are your transactions, right, you may want to slice them by location, right? You wanna see the New York versus San Francisco. You may wanna slice them by product category, or, or you may wanna slice them by both. And, and doing those operations on this potentially gigantic transaction table is computationally intensive. Um, so what you can do instead is pre-aggregate these values, right? We know that New York bar um, is 200, right? And, and that's a flattened complete um, set of all the transactions which have New York and bar. So uh, if you're familiar today with the pivot table operations, right? It's, it's taking a underlying raw table, pivoting on, on every possible dimension. There's that multi-dimensionality um, in the multi-dimensional OLAP and providing you with these pre-aggregated values. And then you query on top of that to sort of compose the metrics that your business users would want to see. Um, before we move on, right, this is, this is sort of the main thing I wanna make sure everyone understands. So happy to stop here for, for questions if, if there's any confusion in terms of what is an OLAP cube? So this table, which you show on the screen right now, is this the cube? This is the cube. So we've taken all of the dimensions which are available to me here, right? Um, in this case, location, product category, year and month. And we've transformed that into these aggregations here on the right, broken out by every combination of dimensions that I, that I include in my dimension set. So now I can query this if there were say 500,000 records that are New York bar for January of 2021, it becomes only one record with a, with a single amount, which I can then query on top of. In this set, they're very similar in size just because we have a tiny record set, right? But um, this does extend to arbitrarily large amounts of, of input raw data. Oh, okay, so it's easy, okay. <laughs> It's just a pivot table, right? And there's so much confusion around what is it? How does it work? And, and there's a lot of frameworks that have been built on top of it. Um, so things like just how do you deal with the star schema? How do you deal with all these various pieces that are thrown around? But at the end of the day, it's really just a, a pivot table. Cool. Um, so what I really want to hit on here is just wh why should we care now, right? Well, here we are. 30 years after it was developed and what is, what can we learn from this? Um, so primarily, um, well, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about each one of these points. So computations on aggregate values are still faster, right? It's, it's always going to be faster to filter or, or to apply your uh, computations on these aggregate values. It's just so much, um, everything else has gotten so much faster that the difference between computing on raw data and computing on aggregate data is in most cases negligible, right? There is there is performance gains to be had, but it's really not worth the work of sort of setting up this cube, setting up the infrastructure for these cubes um, and, and all of the maintenance involved with sort of adding dimensions and, and these operations you'll need to do to maintain a structure with this, it, it's really just not worth it anymore. Um, but computations are still faster. So there are cases where you may want to take some piece of this. Um, if you're working in a company that happens to have used them before, frequently they'll still be around, right? So you may need to deal with OLAP pipelines, even if that's not the uh, optimal way of handling data nowadays. Um, and maybe you do a migration from OLAP, but you do need to maintain that same sort of um, paradigm of being able to query that data. So right now, uh, Firebolt, 
Apache Druid are similar, not quite full app cubes exactly. They have a lot of optimizations and a lot of modernity that has been built into them. But it's that same paradigm of I have pre aggregated my values, so I don't have to go back to the raw data every time. Um, the more important things I think that we can learn and, and think about from OLAP cubes is, is that it really was the foundation of what we think of as data engineering today, right? So it required that you have a large team who can build out these pipelines, right? Who can um, sort of put together and maintain a data pipeline to ingest raw data, to do the transformations, and then load it in this new query optimized format. Um, so it's both the inception of the modern data engineering team, right? and the ETL pipeline, right? You needed to extract, transform, and load to get here. Um, and so a lot of what we'd see now in terms of, you know, uh, integration uh, integration startups, right? They're doing very similar things to this. They're taking your data, transforming it, loading it somewhere else. Um, and that really started with the OLAP cube. Um, and then the last thing is that a lot of the operations we do are still falling into that OLAP framework, right? You, you do queries very specific, um, you do aggregations very specific to your query. You're doing some on a column, you're doing a slice and a dice, right? You're doing a group by, which came from this original OLAP cube that sort of took over everywhere. Um, the other thing that, that I will talk about is that these categorical dimensions, the dimensions in your OLAP cube will roll up to each other in very specific ways, right? So you'll you'll say that I have a hierarchy between my team and my department, right? And that structure can be built into the cube as it once was. And now that structure can be built into sort of a, a dimension table, which exists separate from your actual records. And that's referenced, but that paradigm of having a roll up defined in one way where it's deterministically set, right, your a particular team always rolls up to a particular department, sort of comes from these, these initial columnar values. Uh, cool. So obviously we've moved away, right? We, we don't use these too much anymore, especially in new systems. And um, so it's important to sort of talk about why. It's a lot of design, it's a lot of management to, to keep these up, to, to spin one up and, and maintain it. You need to know what are all the dimensions I have? How do I make sure that they're cleaned, that they're sanitized, that they're fully broken out? Um, if I wanna add a new one, how do I do that? Especially in terms of making sure that the relationship with the other dimensions are set. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, which is why this developed the, the data engineering team. You needed quite a few folks to maintain one of these pipelines, one of these complex pipelines, especially. Um, the OLAP cube also makes additive queries very simple, right? I can take um, I can take this sum amount column, right? And if I wanted to see New York, I can just filter to New York here and sum these values, very easy. But if I wanted to do something more like ending employees, right? Or ending customers or any of these computations which are not simply additive, it gets very hard and you have to do some weird workarounds in terms of um, how do you tag particular levels of aggregation um, separately. And sometimes it's not even possible. Sometimes you do have to go back to the records for, for very complex calculations. So um, it can be very tricky. And a lot of what has been done over the past decade, right, with, with things like Snowflake and, and all these other offerings, um, is that it has simplified that we've got the compute power where you don't really have to pre-aggregate these things anyways. Um, so, so you don't have to do these workarounds in terms of making sure that everything is treated as additive. And, and the last sort of main difficulty um, is that record data is inaccessible, right? Once you have done this aggregation, you don't really know, okay, what, what were the records that, that generated this value? Um, how do I get back to them? you can build in systems to sort of track that and, and link your output values to your input records. Um, but again, it, it's added complexity. So these are 
a powerful tool that took a lot of work, a lot of design work, and, and just a lot of ongoing maintenance and effort to keep in existence. Um, so they're, they're largely unnecessary now. We have better solutions, um, but there are, there are always exceptions. So the, we were able to actually um, utilize the OLAP cubes um, in our initial stages of our startup um, because it provides us with the ability to uh, have quick operations for our end users. Um, we, we operate in the finance space, so these things don't really change very frequently. We're not dealing with real-time data. Um, and so we can do this pre-aggregation um, and dynamically generate something which is similar to a cube. It's, it's, um, we have some other complexities, obviously, because we need these um, we do need to go back to the records and, and have these drill down operations. Um, but it does give us a framework in which you can quickly iterate, right? You know that you have this cube structure and, and you can build on it. Um, obviously it doesn't scale particularly well, right? And so this is one of the things where we're as a company looking at, okay, how do we move to formalizing a more performant uh, solution, right? But it's very good for quickly iterating in terms of um, uh, this small, relatively static data. Um, so that is about all I have here. I have some resources though. Um, this, this original paper that Cobb wrote is, is quite interesting. Um, so I would recommend giving that one a look if you want a, a very deep dive. Um, this analytics club engineer is also a great just resource on sort of the basics. Um, but to, to sum up, right, um, we are, as data engineers and working in the data space, we are standing on the shoulders of giants, right? People who spent a lot of time thinking about how do they um, get around the constraints that are put on them by their technologies, right? And how do you use really math at the end of the day? How do you mathematically put together a system that makes sense and that uh, delivers value for, for end users? Um, and a lot of those paradigms that were set up by these geniuses, I would say, um, a lot of these paradigms were still carry over, right? And we see these same things being used in different ways and, and different components of them. Um, but I think you can always look at a data pipeline, every, every one that I've seen, and just you see bits and pieces, right? Of, okay, we're using a concept that really originated in the 90s with OLAP cubes. Um, so that's all I've got for you today. Um, so thanks for listening. Uh, Makani, I have a question. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. It was a very good presentation. Uh, I want to ask, so OLAP cube is always just one table or sometimes you split it? So there are... I think in the original conception, right, in the 1993 paper, it, it was one table. There's um, something that you can, you'll find, which is HOLAP, hybrid OLAP cube, where they will have sort of multiple tables um, or, or a hybrid of a table and the records themselves. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways that you can sort of utilize this concept. Um, you can have multiple OLAP cubes and then just route to the proper one. Right. When you were talking about speed uh well nowadays data also grew right so now you have terabytes <laughs> tens right. of terabytes right. hundreds petabytes and then of course uh, i guess all up cube is very useful uh, it, it is fast i think it's not always the proper solution i think a lot of that speed especially with large data right you can get the same performance with doing good partitioning right with doing sort of proper indexing um, and you can get sort of the same performance gains that you would have with OLAP um, without all of the work. Uh, but there are cases, right, where it does help. And, and so like what we've seen at Veretto is we have a lot of transactional data which doesn't change from day to day. And so the, the OLAP cube gives us a, a structure that we can provide to the user that, that does make sense to them. And finance folks are working with pivot tables all the time. So it's it sort of, uh, aligns with what they've seen. 
So they may have a star schema database, but they still prefer to use OLAP cube simply because it's easier for them to understand how to handle it and query it for their dashboards, right? Right, right. Oh, okay. But then you have to put more work <laughs> into designing it. Well, I think there's, there's, um, it, it's true. It, it is true. Um, I think it gives you more flexibility um, in some ways. Um, I, obviously, we're moving away from it. It doesn't, it doesn't scale um, in the current form. But what you do see is that it gives you, the, the OLAP framework can work for any sort of customer. And so it's, oh, we're using different dimensions. We're using different values, sure. But the same table structure works. Um, with something like a star schema, you have to do more sort of custom joins on things, right? Where the single table just gives you that uh, out the gate in a, in a cohesive manner. Thank you, thank you. It, it was very good, very clear. Uh, awesome. Anybody have a question? Hmm? Nobody. <laughs> cool. Okay, I'll yes. stop recording.